Knowledge is power. Make an impact by learning more or hire us to do it for you. Let us focus on what we do best so you can stay focused on what you do best. Find all of our options under services, one-to-one training, subscription-based training, or accounting and business consulting. I think it's mostly the same people who were in our 97 and up call yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants a little part two. We know we need part two. I a need part of, one again. We need part one and a half. I was going to say a lot of this is going to be a repeat of part one, but a little, it'll, actually it'll be a little smoother because yesterday was practice, right? Right. <laughs> but you, you always give these little pearls of wisdom and that's what I sit and listen for and make notes about. Oh yeah, I'd love to know what those are. I probably need them. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're they're pearls of wisdom to me, maybe not to you, but to no, me, I love. Come, I'm not even kidding. Coming. I would love to know what those are because maybe they would be valuable <laughs> to others. Okay. You should uh, share your notes with us. <laughs> I shall. I. Uh, it's funny. Yesterday, I shared notes that uh, with a client from a call we took, and you know me, I'm pretty organized i had it all sketched out in one note nice detailed outline after we got off the phone i spent like probably a half an hour organizing the notes and i sent them to him and he writes back much better than my chicken scratch <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny yeah, that's funny who's kitty right. we're going live on facebook oh it's my kitty <laughs> oh i thought that was my inner child <laughs> Hmm. One, two. All right, I think we're about to be live on Facebook. 20 minutes later, going live, setting up webinar for Facebook Live. Waiting, redirecting. Hold on. Wait for it. Good morning. We're live. Happy Friday. It's uh, February 8th, 2019. Notice I had to check the calendar because it feels like it should still be 2018. Um, and we're live. I'm just going to take the live feed from my Nerd Enterprises Inc. Facebook page and share it over to our Between Wall and Main Strategy Forum group. So uh, bear with me while I do that. Talk amongst yourselves. Grab your coffee. Grab your popcorn. Grab something. Grab a sweater if you're cold. <laughs> Linda, how's the weather in Florida? Is it warm there? It is. We Genesis had frost. You have what? frost? We had frost Genesis. this morning. There's frost on the cars. Matt, did Genesis. you have frost? You know, I thought there was some kind of saying in California about, yeah, we get all of the seasons. We just skip the crappy ones. I want to like move back to the California that I like, which is sunny, because it's been cold and rainy and everything out here. Yeah, but at least we haven't had like negative 40 degrees. It feels like it. <laughs> we we had snow up here. Did you really? Yeah, oh. just the other day. I thought I saw on Tuesday night a sign on the 5 freeway that said something about snow. And I was like, what? And I'm assuming they were warning traffic that was heading up further north. I was like, wow. 76 and sunny. There's snow nice. in Seattle. Snow and ice. <laughs> No, well, you signed up for that. <laughs> That's right. I like my uh, snow commute a lot better than I did when I was working downtown. We had 18 degrees, felt like seven this morning. What's that, Tammy? Sorry, it was hard to hear. Ooh. 18 degrees, felt like seven. And where are you located? Oklahoma. Okay. All right. Sorry. All right. So uh, I think we can uh, get this party started. We've got no more attendees waiting to come in. We've got the live feed on the Between Wall and Main group. And of course, directly on Nerd Enterprises Inc.'s Facebook page. So, smart sheet. <laughs> you want to talk about something else instead? No. <laughs> I want smart sheet. <laughs> you want smart sheet. We want smart sheet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, for those who weren't and aren't in 97 Up, therefore weren't on the call yesterday, which inspired this. Um, we, you know, we look at a lot of different project management solutions, um, as all of us do in our industry, where everybody's trying to find the holy grail of project management, which by the way, little secret, you're never gonna find it. 
Um, <laughs> cause there's just, everybody's got a different use case and everybody's got different things that are important to them. So there's never going to be a one size fits all solution. In fact, I'm convinced, especially after yesterday, I think it just validated what I've thought and said for a long time that there's probably not even one solitary solution for any one person, you know, and I frequently say this, it's the right tool for the right job, right? And that's why I don't mind having all these apps in my toolbox, you know, because the more I have, the more opportunities I have to identify and understand when the right tool is meant to be used for the right job. So uh, that being said, we have uh, the kind of high level project management apps that a lot of us use. Active Collab is my favorite. Some of you use Asana. Some of you are using Trello. Um, I talked to a guy yesterday, actually, it was, it was like a man after my own heart. I, it, it, it felt like he must have been watching my videos. He used all the apps that I love. And he was not an accountant. He was a, a, a contractor. So anyway, that was kind of cool. But so we have this array of project management apps in my, in my browser bookmarks under services, under project management. Here's the list I've got. And keep in mind, some of these are project management, some of these are workflow. There's a lot of overlap between the two, but there are differences, and this is kind of my point. This is what I think is important for us to understand. When I hire a handyman to come and do some fix-up work around my house, and he brings his toolbox, I look in that box, and it's overwhelming to me because I don't know what to do with half that stuff. But he knows exactly what to do with these tools. When I show him the job, he knows exactly which tools he needs to take out to do the job. He doesn't say, oh, I can't deal with all these tools, right? And to me, this is our version of that, right? We want to fill up our toolbox. We want to learn how to use a lot of different apps because, again, the right tool for the right job. So if I look down my list under uh, project management, and mind you, this is by no means even remotely exhaustive. This is just stuff that I've used, you know, over the years, some of which I don't use anymore uh, and some I still do. So 17 hats is on the list, and this is alphabetical, so the number 17. Uh, Asana. Atlas, A-T-L-A-Z, which kind of took Trello's concept and built on it and made it so that you could kind of go a little deeper. They almost went under and then somebody came in and saved them and gave them some VC funding. Um, so interesting story with Atlas. Are you sharing? What? No, I'm not sharing my screen. I'm just going down a list. Sorry about that. That's okay. That's okay. You probably, you, you had a very high likelihood of being right that I forgot to share my screen. In this case, it was, the, you hit the 2%. <laughs> So go get a lottery ticket today. Um, Evernote, of course, right? Google Keep. Uh, I threw this one out there during one of our 97 and up calls. And uh, much to my surprise, I'll be honest, a couple people hadn't even heard of it and now live by it, right? Who was that? Was that you, Lisa? <laughs> I want to say somebody in our group was like, I never heard of this before. And now they're all over it. Linda, that's you. So, uh, and then we have, now, so this is an interesting one, Lucid Chart is something I've played with and I love playing with it. It's not, it's, it's not really project management per se. I just kind of stuck it in there because I didn't know where else to put it. But it's, it's more of a, a mind mapping tool, a flow charting tool. It's just, just get Lucid Chart and I have an affiliate link. So email me if you want it and I'll get it to you. Um, whatever's in the chat, I'll check on that in a minute. Uh, I found this one called Pinup, which is like sticky notes and cork boards and collaboration, which I thought was kind of cool to play with. Scaleless kind of came and went. But I still have, my, when I go into my Scalus account, it still works. I can still do it. But it looks like they kind of changed it over. I don't think you can start a new Scalus account uh, if you were trying to today. Of course, smart sheets on this list. The Brain. A lot of you have seen me show The Brain, right? I love The Brain. I just wish I could get more people to buy into it so that we could collaborate with it. But it takes two paid accounts to do any kind of collaborating with The Brain. And it's not really that expensive. It's like two fifty a year. It's totally worth it to me for that even just for a toy to play with, which is, um, you know, I go in and out of it. The only c complaint I have about the brain is they haven't kept up on their mobile app, right? Uh, Workflowy, right, which is bullet points on steroids. Um, I forgot because I had had it in my main bookmarks. There's Dynalist, which I kind of left Workflowy for Dynalist. I, I cheated on Workflowy with Dynalist, and then I just left Workflowy altogether for Dynalist. Um, and then there's Wonderlist, and then there's Zoho Projects, right? There's a million others. Somebody uh, yesterday mentioned Basecamp, right? Uh, Basecamp is another one, very well known. It's a Citrix product, <laughs> I believe. Anyway, so lots of lots of project management tools out there. And in our conversation yesterday, we were talking about Active Collab specifically, and I've shown everybody in our group my process for how I kind of manage things in Active Collab. Um, and recently I did it on one of those daily lives that I started to do. 
Um, and now I am going to share my screen. That says top 5% with QuickBooks and top 2% with Nerds. Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I, I went over my process as I've gone over it many times. I have this project called Nerd Main. This is where I just keep high level stuff that I have to do. Very low on detail. Just kind of like fleeting thought. I need to remember to do this. It might be a client related task that I need to perform that I'll just stick in here until I have time to move it over to the actual client's project, right? So you can see I still have to send Matt his talk triggers book. Same to Mariette. Um, notice I have that on today, right? So my high level kind of stuff to do list is in a, 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 you know, an active collab in a main project and I organize my task list by day, right? So what happened yesterday is we got to talking and people were saying, hey, I'm getting overwhelmed. I have all these tasks in active collab, right? And I, it's, it's getting hard to manage. And so, you know, I've learned I have to dig in a little and get deeper and find out exactly why that might be, right? What are you doing? How are you using it? And what was happening is I forget uh, which one of us it was, but one of us was describing that they had, you know, in a given client, lots of bank accounts and lots of credit card accounts. And you want to remember that every month, you know, bank accounts usually close on, the, on, a, on a monthly cycle. So that you could pretty much say beginning of the month, reconcile all bank accounts. That would be my task, my one task for all the bank accounts just to reconcile. But if I have, you know, two different bookkeepers, um, hopefully, again, and this goes to bigger picture setup, hopefully I have one person managing that whole client, right? So that one person gets that one task that says reconcile all the bank accounts for this client, right? So there it should be simple, but then we've got credit card accounts which have all different closing dates, right? Could be any day of the month, a credit card account could be closing and a statement could be getting produced, right? That's where this gets a little clunky because now I need a separate task for each credit card account to remind me to reconcile, or remind whoever it's assigned to to reconcile. And that's where it gets clunky. And when we got to that level of depth with it, that's when it hit me and I said, oh, I don't do that in Active Collab, <laughs> right? That's where Smartsheet comes into the picture. Now, that said, I'll share my screen again because then that's when we start getting into that sort of struggle of, oh, but I have all these different tools. How do I manage it? So I want to be clear about something in terms of exactly how I manage this. I think I have a sample project still in here. Yeah. Business management client sample. By the way, control K is what I did in Active Collab to quickly jump, right, and type the name of a project. So, and that works in Slack too. It's becoming more and more common of a command. Control K is becoming like a universal. It used to be the universal insert hyperlink command, but I guess people don't need that all the time. So it's becoming the universal jump command. So here's a sample client. And all I have, among other things, I have a reference task list. And in that reference task list, I have Smartsheet Workspace. And here would be the link to that client's Smartsheet Workspace. So when I start working on a client, the first thing I do is open up Active Collab and go to their project. And then from here, I've created essentially bookmarks, right, where I can just go, boom, get me into Smartsheet, get me into Google Drive if I need to, if I think I'm going to need to be sending communications to the client, then I also pop out Nimble because that's my CRM. So now I have everything open, everything I need to work on that client available in three clicks, right? Four if you count getting into Active Collab itself. <clears throat> so this is command central. This is how I manage it, right? In a real live client, it would look something like this, right? And I still had it selected from yesterday and I knew that. So this way you're not seeing anything else other than his reference section, but click on Smartsheet workspace. There's the link. Boom. That's going to take me right into his Smartsheet workspace. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen because of course his has confidential stuff in there. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to get into my sample workspace so we can play. Right. But so that's a little bit on workflow with respect to project management. Right. Let's check in on the live feed and see if anybody's uh, saying anything. It doesn't look like it. I'll pull this over to my other screen. And we'll close that down. Okay. Okay. Nobody commenting on the live feed. Shocking. Shocking. Okay, so here is my sort of 97 and up uh, Smartsheet workspace. So this, you know, is something where we have templates and things that we share with people who are in the program. Um, and so let's go into my sample uh, reference project. So I have a reference sheet. These are templates, right? 
I might have called it this. No, that's the actual bookkeeping checklist. Let's go back. You know, I'm just going to use this template. So we'll start from a blank so you can kind of see it get built. So this is what I always call the reference sheet. Right, so I notice I had it saved as a template. So anytime I needed, I just turned that template into an actual project. Um, by the way, a little smart sheet tip. Um, if you have projects that are you're using for a client and you, you're no longer really using it, but you don't want to lose it, you can save it as a template and delete the initial project. And the templates don't count towards your sheet count in Smartsheet. So that's a way of saving the data without using up a sheet because whatever plan you have has a certain limit to the number of sheets you can use. Um, the one I have has a lot, um, but if you're on like a lower plan, you might be worried about hitting those limits. So that's one way to uh, avoid or delay hitting those limits. So your smart sheet has a lot of sheet in it? Yeah, I'm full of sheets. <laughs> okay, now, so, Let's say I'm setting this up for a client. Now, so think of it like this. First of all, Active Collab is strictly internal. It doesn't get shared with the client, right? Smartsheet is the project management tool I use that I do share with the client. So I will invite the client in. A um, couple of good reasons for that. Number one, Smartsheet, I don't have to pay to add. I can add all the clients I want. There's no limit. Active Collab has a client user type too. But I just, Active Collab I want reserved for internal, for me and my team and not the client. Right? I need a place where I can have dialogue about these tasks that doesn't necessarily go in front of the client because clients just not knowing any better, if they see something can easily take something out of context and it opens up a can of worms and now I'm spending time answering questions I really never needed to. Right? So it's, you need that I think, is I think you need one thing that's internal that's not facing the client and one that is external that you do share with the client. Right? Uh, hang on, let me let the illustrious Marriott into the group the illustrious Marriott. Let's see if Marriott is driving right now. Usually she is, we're checking in with Marriott. Marriott, are you driving? Perhaps not. She's muted, maybe that means she is. All right, I'll get back to work. Sorry, just say to me, Seth, get back to work. <laughs> um, so, recap. Active Collab, internal, just for me and my team. Smart sheet shared with the client, right? And so what I'm going to do is, so let's say the client banks with, and I knew something was missing, <laughs> my glasses. How about that now? I'm about to look at my screen. And I'm like, it looks a little fuzzy. It's fuzzy. Much better. So let's say they bank with Wells Fargo and they have, you know, like four bank accounts or something. So I'm going to create one line item called Wells Fargo, right? And then we'll put Wells Fargo... And just the last four digits of the account number to identify one account from another, right? So five, six, seven, or five, six, eight, nine. Okay. Now, while I have this here, over here in Smartsheet, you're going to see, not that, that's wrap text. Um, where'd my, in, here's my indent tool. Now, Smartsheet, this isn't like indenting in Microsoft Word. It actually has more meaning. Remember, Smartsheet is like a spreadsheet, but with powerful project management tools. So notice what it did the minute I indented it. Pay attention to the top one, the parent, or what's about to be the parent, and what it does, it creates, it basically groups it, right? So as soon as I indent this, it says, oh, okay, so we're grouping this, all the Wells Fargo accounts, so now I can have another Wells Fargo, right? So let's say one's operating, one's a trust account or something, six, five, four, eight, okay? And then if that is the case, then probably what I would do, because I'm not gonna remember from the account number, I'll put general here, trust here, right? And then here I'll put the login. Now let's say I also have a Wells Fargo credit card, right? Okay, and here I can put the URL. Because when I'm working on this client, I just have this sheet up and yeah, of course I can put it in my browser bookmarks and I have a Wells Fargo bookmark in my bookmarks. But again, my, my goal when I set up these systems is to make my own life very easy, right? So why not? It doesn't cost me anything extra. I'll put the link right in here so that when it's time to log in, I can just click on this link, right? And then of course, I have LastPass to log me in to any Wells Fargo clients. So I just make my job easy. I make it so that everything's right there at my fingertips. Because remember, I have this open, I have this open, and I have QuickBooks Online open, right? 
and maybe even nimble. So I, ju I just open up the tabs that I need to work on that particular client, and I close any other tabs, by the way. Because any other tab besides the ones that I need to work on this client, are, it's, it's basically me begging for a distraction, right? So there's one of my pearls of wisdom, Carolyn. <laughs> right, is that one on the list? I agree. <clears throat> I agree with that one completely. It's my biggest problem. Yeah, that's what I do. Because you know what happens? I get, I get lonely. And so I'll open up Facebook and I'll be like, oh, I'll just leave Facebook open so I can talk to somebody if I get, and it's like, next thing I know I'm on Facebook and not getting the client work done, right? <laughs> so, so close Facebook, close Twitter, close Pinterest, close everything except the tabs you need to work on that client. And then, because I've, I've, I've gotten scared sometimes when I've done one-on-one, -on -one, some of them with some of you, right? And I see the number of tabs that are open. You can't even read what's in the tab because they're so small because Chrome is, yeah, Matthew, <laughs> right? So there's, there's probably a good chance that you have some tabs there that you can close, right? So anyway, only <laughs> the tabs open that you absolutely need. So now I have a credit card, right? The statement dates, I don't really care about. There's really no relevant due date on the bank accounts because like I said, bank accounts are pretty much closed at the end of the month. If you happen to have a bank account, by the way, that doesn't close at the end of the month, all you ever need to do is call the bank and ask them to change it to a calendar month cutoff and they will do that. You know, they'll just do a short month one month and then they will cut it off. So Matthew says he has a fourth monitor for just all my tabs. You know what I tried to do? I tried to use this little uh, multiple desktop trick, right? So I can open up a second desktop and throw some stuff on there. I tried that. It was I, knowing it was there. I kept wanting to go there and check it. I kept forgetting about them, <laughs> and then I got upset because <laughs> I couldn't find anything. <laughs> right. So bottom line, if you, and you know what, and you know what I learned, of course, and sometimes I need to sort of teach myself at this very elementary a level. Is it's almost like I talk to myself like I'm a three year old, and I say, "Okay, Seth." If you just focus on this job, on this client, and just do their work, you'll get it done in a fraction of the time, and then you can go play with your toys, right? <laughs> and that's literally how I look at this stuff. I had a client when I did a I did a um one on one with him, and he's like, "Whoa, look at all the tabs you have open!" I'm like, "Oh God." <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I just, the best productivity tool ever is the big X on your browser right there. Just close it all and then reopen, start over. Um, also, you might want to do a reboot because if you have all those tabs open for a really long time, it starts to tax the memory on your computer, by the way, which is another reason not to do it. So, because every browser tab you have open is pinging your processor constantly for updates or your Another processor. pearl. What? Another pearl. There we go. Another pearl. I really want you to make a list, Carolyn, of every pearl. I want to see them because I'm curious to see what might be perceived as a pearl because a lot of times I don't know. I just say things. <laughs> Seth, don't forget yeah. that every extension you have on Chrome is also a resource hog. Yep. Yeah. So limit the extensions to just those you need. Strangely, notice I put this Gmail extension on here, which shows me that I have 39 new emails. And I thought that would be a really bad idea, but I've, I've, part of it is almost like, it's almost like Pavlov's training, where I just train myself to ignore it. <laughs> anyway, getting to the point at hand, because we got some good stuff here. So the credit card, next statement date. Let's say my next statement date is February 13th. Wait, if you train yourself to ignore it, then why do you have it? to train myself to ignore it so that I, this way I can use it. It's there when I need it, when I'm ready to go check my emails, right? Don't just leave the tab open. Because then I find myself going to it. I, I'm not able to ignore that so easily. You're weird. I am weird. It's Jedi training. It's Jedi training. It is Jedi training, right? Do you have if I have, if I have the tab open and I see whose email it is, I may be more inclined to want to go read it, depending especially on who it's from, right? If I see an email and in the headers I see you effing a-hole, <laughs> it's going to be very hard to ignore that. Matthew's going to send me that email right now. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you guess? Did you have a specific number? Like if it hits 50, then you open it? <laughs> no, I should, but I don't. I just, the, I, and, and at one point I took this off because it was distracting me. 
but I've gotten to the point now where it doesn't bother me. Like I, I just, it's just almost like, okay, I know when I get, when I get time or when I want to set aside time to go through my emails, there's emails there. Right. That's all. How many digits will it show? <laughs> I think it gets to 99 and that's it. I think once it gets over a hundred and mind you, most mornings I start off with like 400, but I reverse engineer the process and I mark every, I, I select everything that's unread and then I uncheck the things I want to keep and then I delete the rest. And that's a very efficient way, by the way, of getting rid of all my junk mail that I don't care to read. That usually gets it down to under a hundred quickly. And my rule is I like to keep it always under a hundred. So, cause then it doesn't feel overwhelming. And I know that if I have all my emails under a hundred, I can usually get, I can almost always get through all hundred of those, assuming all hundred are ones I actually need to do something with. Um, usually within an hour I can get through them because either they're going to get dealt with or forwarded. Uh, these days I'm forwarding my emails to OneNote, um, you know, for sort of later handling. Um, anyway, so that's that story. So I put in the next statement date. I get the logins for Wells Fargo and, you know, the logins, I could put a column in for the username and password. I don't, I don't want it that front facing. If I'm somewhere public and I'm, you know, if I'm in a Starbucks and I've got this open, I don't want people seeing usernames and passwords. So for that, excuse me, I use the comments feature here. This way it's hidden, right? I can put username, love, password, secret, right? And so it's here when I need it with easy access, but it's sort of hidden, right? Nobody walking by my screen is going to see that kind of information. If you're wondering about smart sheet security, yes, they've got extremely good security. Um, Matt says, or you could set up Ledger Sync. Ledger Sync handles logging in. I thought it just grabs the stuff. Yeah, your clients go in and actually set the username and password. So uh -huh. that's it. Well, in a perfect see, that, But you just hit the nail on the problem right there when you said your client, right? I, I don't rely on clients for anything. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, but truth be told, if you have ledger sync, like even when I was using HubDoc a little bit, I did all the setup for them. I got their logins and set it up for them. I wasn't going to count on the client because then that's a whole other can of worms, right? So bottom line, I get the logins in. You can use LastPass too. I used to leave LastPass aside just for me and I didn't really want to use it for clients, but I'm finding that it's handy to use it for clients too. You can put things in folders and so I can create a folder for the client and put all their stuff in their folder. So it's manageable. Um, it still gets a little clunky when I want to share it. And yes, I can share a LastPass login with Erica so that Erica can use it to log in. Um, but then Erica's on a Mac and LastPass doesn't work as well on the Mac. It doesn't seem, I don't know, maybe whatever it's, it is what it is, but I like having Smartsheet is kind of the backup archive and we do normally keep the client's passwords there so that this way I can share Smartsheet and this way also if Erica is logging in and it prompts her to update a password, she just updates in Smartsheet and you know, we're good. So next statement date 213. Now th this is important. The due date, let's say would then be like, uh, usually the due date is maybe a couple weeks after the statement date, right? Like 14 days later. So let's just say 228. Okay, so this is the key. Now, I don't know about your clients, but my clients get really, really upset when things get paid late, especially when they're counting on me to pay them on time. So I don't want to even really think too much about the due date. I want to focus on the statement date. As soon as that statement cuts, I want to make sure I grab it and enter it as a bill in QuickBooks so that I can review that with the client. And, you know, in some cases, the client gives me carte blanche and says, just pay everything whenever, as soon as, as soon as it's available to be paid, right? Other clients need to gauge their cash flow a little better so that we uh, have to, you know, so that we have to uh, take a look at it with the client. So bottom line, I want to make sure that the moment that statement cuts, I can get that bill into QBO so that the client and I can look at it and decide whether or not and how much we want to pay, right? Because a lot of times on a credit card, we're not going to pay the whole thing, okay? Over here, I usually, I usually have this column that indicates some things we just put on auto pay, right? especially credit cards, we like to put them on auto pay for at least the minimum amount. That way there's never a late fee, right? If they're not paying the thing off in full. Um, and, but then I like to know that because I know that's less of a priority. I don't have to worry about that as much, right? I still want to get the bill in there and review with the client to see how much more than the minimum we might want to pay, right? Then I have manual pay, which means this needs attention immediately. I need to make sure it gets in there. Okay. Now, 
I'm getting this, I've gotten this even more automated um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Over here I have the status where it's either work in process, which means I'm getting the logins from the client. I don't have everything I need yet or it's completed, meaning it's completed and there's nothing left to do. Or in a case like this, once it's completed, we call it reference information, right? Because it's there for reference when I need it, right? So it stays a completed item. I might filter the list out eventually and say, oh, don't show me the completed stuff. Only show me work in process and reference. I see Matthew, he's like, that's really smart. I got another pearl. <laughs> so, so I do that. And then for clients that have more than one entity, I have, I indicate, so this way I have one project for all their companies with all this stuff in one place, right? So I have uh, an entity or account owner column for this where I can indicate it's company one, company two, or it's their personal, right? That helps. All right, next thing we do is, and de this depends on the client and how much they're paying us, frankly, but the clients who are at a little higher tier of payment with us, <clears throat> we'll check their balances every two days and key them in here. And I have a notification set up that every time we update the balance, Smartsheet, it triggers an email from Smartsheet to me and the client. So if Erica goes in and updates their balances, I get an email notification that lets me see very quickly, here's the client's balances, right? So for clients, especially where we really want to monitor cash flow for them, it's helpful and the clients love it because they, this way they're just made aware very regularly of what their balances are. There's just fewer surprises that way. There's fewer calls from the client saying, holy crap, I'm down to $2,000. Why didn't you tell me, right? Because it's like, no, you get an email every two days with an update, you know? So it's, it's in my experience, it's really smart, right? So I put in, I can, you can use just like QuickBooks, you can put a T to have Smartsheet put in today's date. So I'd say I checked the uh, balance today. The balance was uh, 105,000. And let's say the prudent reserve is, uh, 100,000, right? The prudent reserve, of course, being that minimum amount that we want to see in the account at all times. And so the buffer just takes the prudent reserve or the current balance rather minus the prudent reserve. You write formulas here just like you do Excel. And so it shows me I'm 5,000 in the black or, or in the, in, yeah, in, in the black. No, yeah, in the black, not the red. Sorry, I get my colors confused. I'm colorblind. Matthew's colorblind, <laughs> not me. Um, now, this is going to get real interesting because now that we have this one thing sort of completely filled out, um, I'm going to, now we're going to start setting up some conditional formatting and some alerts, right? I want to show you how this works and how it gets really cool. Let me just check in on the, uh, the chats, the live Facebook feed, no questions so far. Hey, Holly. Hey, Gina. Hey, Larry. Larry's at the doctor's office. Larry, I hope it goes well. Mariette says, hola to all, jumping into my cafecito Friday meeting. Catch you all later. Hugs. P.S. I love Smartsheet for tax prep. Are all right. you going to show the conditional formatting part where if that balance were at 95000 that it would? No, I'm not going to show that. No, right. forget. Yeah, we, we wouldn't want any more pearls. Yeah, no. <laughs> Hold on. Let me let the, my friend Shannon in here. And then <laughs> can you guys talk amongst yourselves for two minutes while I refill my cup of coffee because you don't want me to run out of steam here. I will be back in, in like 60 seconds. Talk amongst yourselves. Go over what the pearls have been so far. I want a full list. All right, Carolyn, are you, are you, are you uh, taking minutes here? Are you? <laughs> I, I just, you know, every time he speaks, I just make notes of things that I need to remember because I can't remember anything. And um, <laughs> you take shorthand because he talks really fast. No, I. I sorry. I'm now, I'm actually surprised that that, didn't, that doorbell didn't get my dog either. <laughs> Mine too. The chain reaction. Where's my coffee, Greg? I want my coffee. My coffee <laughs> is about half full here. <laughs> You got to get out to our next meetup, Lynn. Okay. Oh, I'll get you. you to fly out there? Yeah. <laughs> I did. Just around the corner. Janice, meet me. We'll go over there. <laughs> I, I flew out there. Yeah. You, all right. There's a difference between flying <laughs> from Florida. It's like nine hours. Come on. Excuses, excuses. <laughs> it did look fun, though. I have to say it did look Wait, can you lot. get a jet suite from Florida to California? No. I have to fly go that far? I think they're just <laughs> in the southwest. 
Oh, well, too bad. Greg took a private jet here. He did? Yeah. See, but he's been in 97 and up longer than you, so he uh, rolls like that now. Okay. I'll, at life goals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kids today. Okay, so let's do some conditional formatting. Formatting. Seth, I have a question for you. I have an answer. Are you, you're no longer using HubDoc to... I really don't use it. I just, the, the constant having to fix authentication issues was driving me crazy. So I don't. We have like one or two, I think we have one, maybe two clients that Erica still has on it. And once those clients go away, we will probably stop altogether. So what do you use for document fetching? I go to Smartsheet, I log in, I download a PDF. Um, okay. The other thing we do is we're using Bilbies to archive all that stuff. So in some cases for bank statements and things, you know, we get empowered ourselves to go log in and grab the stuff, right? Bank statements I don't need in Bilbies, we just dump those in Google Drive and keep it there, right? So it's a little manual, but it works consistently when I just go log in and fetch it myself, right? Yeah. And client to client, it doesn't really take much time, right? I go in, most clients have several accounts at one bank. So it's one login, one time download that month's statements. Mm -hmm. And then we have it to reconcile them. And then that's pretty much it. Um, the bills, and this is what I was actually alluding to a few minutes ago. You know, I have a client to client. I set up slightly different processes, but I took on a personal injury attorney recently. And they have a lot of bills, right? Especially the doctors from the settlements who need to get paid and all this. So we have a really slick setup with them. I'll stop sharing for a minute while I explain this and then I'll get into the conditional formatting. It's just a way to keep you all in suspense and keep you here for the smart sheet part. Um, so here's what I did. The client himself, he, he's like anti-tech, right? He, you know, he doesn't want anything to do with technology, but he has an assistant who's reasonably okay with tech, right? And so I basically work with his assistant. And here's what I set up. First of all, I use G Suite. So I set up a Google group, right? And it's client name at nerdenterprises.com is the alias, which functions just like an email address. Do you have and, to pay for, for an additional user if you do that or no? Nah? No, that's the beauty of it is that, no, you're not paying for users, it's just an alias, right? And it's really not even designed to be an alias because separately you can set up an alias, that's actually something else. But a group is just a way to include several people on a distribution list, right? And so I can redistribute things. So um, what I do is I create this client name at nerdenterprises.com group and it redistributes in one case to the Bilby's email address that bills need to go to. In another case, to whomever it is at the client's office that wants to get a copy of that bill when it's emailed. And then if I wanted a copy to me, which I usually want those in the beginning, and then I take myself off of it once I know things are up and running smoothly, right? I only need it for a little while to make sure nothing's getting dropped. So we, so we, so we have that part of the setup, and then I give them that email address, and I say, use this email address with any services that send you bills, right? So we really get it substantially automated that way. Next piece, what about the stuff that comes into the office, the paper, the IT guy who doesn't have a login, who doesn't email his bills? It's funny that IT guys don't email their bills. But anyway, um, you know, you run into that kind of stuff. Their landlord, you know, just drops a paper bill at their door. So what I do for that is I say, okay, um, we're going to set up a, you know, I have a client folder in Google Drive for every single client as it is. So I create client name inbox folder in there. And I share just that folder with the client's assistant. And I say, scan the stuff and upload it, right? In this particular case, I even, I've, I made them buy a Fujitsu scan snap. <laughs> I said, you're getting this because it's gonna scan much faster and because the machine they had was very slow and they complained. I said, great, you're gonna spend 420 bucks, whatever it is, but you're gonna be able to scan 25 pages a minute with this thing and it's reliable and it can be connected to the cloud and, and all the reasons why everybody should just have a freaking Fujitsu scan snap, end of story, right? So I, I made them buy that. So now what he does is he scans any bills that come in like that and then he just drags them into the Google Drive folder. But wait, there's more. Once they upload something to that Google Drive folder, Zapier comes in, grabs those PDFs, and emails them to Bilby's for me, and emails a copy to me for now so I can see that it's working, right? 
So now pretty much the minute the client puts any piece of paper that he's received and scanned into that Google Drive folder, it's getting into Bilby's. Bilby's will read the document and push it into QBO if it needs to as a bill to be paid. Bilby's will read the document and it can see if there's language on that bill that says do not pay, the funds will be taken out on such and such a date. It's smart enough to recognize that and it doesn't push it in as a bill. This is why I love Bilby's. This is why I keep talking about Bilby's. It's the smartest software out there. Even down to retrieval, and I, I tested this recently. Um, I compared it. I literally had Bilby's and Receipt Bank open, and I said, what if I want to grab a copy of a bill and send it to a client to get a comment on it, to get a question answered, right? With Bilby's, I get a link to a live PDF that can be sent to anyone. Nobody needs to log into anything to see it. It's one of these really long URLs, so it's not something somebody's going to stumble on by accident, right? But I can just send that to them. With Receipt Bank, when I, sent the, when I grabbed the URL to a particular document and I sent it to an email in a browser session where I wasn't logged into Receipt Bank, of course, it prompted me to log in. So at the very least, I have to create an account just to see that document. That's what we call friction, right? So again, just putting it, because I was thinking, do it, would Receipt Bank serve certain use cases better than Bilby's does? And the bottom line is no, at least not that I've run into now based on this one test, right? So, and this goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning. This is why I like looking at these different tools and understanding which little things each tool handles better. Because in one client's case, I might care about that. In another, I may not, right? And there may be things that Receipt Bank does better than Bilby's, right? So anyway, um, I digress, but this is how I've automated the AP process substantially for clients. I have a quick question on the Bilbies, if, if you would entertain it. Um, can you configure by vendor? Because I've got some auto pays that, that that's great that they build the logic in if the invoice says will be automatically billed. But if I've got some vendors that will still send a bill and then auto pay it. That's fine because let it come in as a bill and when the auto pay goes and it downloads in the bank feed, it'll just match it up. That that works as long as it doesn't flow into the bill pay flow, right? Because No. If I pay a bill and that and I'm in QBO and I have an and, and so now I download that payment. QuickBooks Online is smart enough to see that I've got a bill for the same vendor, date proximity about the same for the same amount, and it will invite you to match up that payment directly to that bill. In other words, I don't have to go in and separately record a bill payment. It will just see this as a payment to match directly to that bill. Yeah. UBO is very smart that way. That's if the timing syncs up is the only problem, I guess. If there's a long lag, then you have to go find a match. Right. But for the most part, this works very seamlessly and smoothly. Right. And anyway, so but that would be my answer on that, Greg. Um, worst case scenario, then you just, you know, when bill, when bills sink in from Bilby's, it goes into an other Bilby's expense account. <clears throat> so you go in there and recode those to the appropriate expense account. Along the way, you can always delete a bill if it's not one that you want in there because, you know, it's going to be auto pay. Right, so that becomes part of the workflow process. And at first, I thought that was going to be a lot of friction, having to go through other Bilbies. But the truth is, when I update it weekly, it's actually really nice because it's easier for me to just run the drill down report in the other Bilbies expense account in QBO and just quickly click in and recode the bills. It's a lot easier than trying to set up logic that says, oh, when it's this vendor plus, Bilbies does have on their roadmap building in the technology that if it sees there's at least three prior bills, for that vendor that go to a, per, a specific account, then it will start auto coding things for you, but they haven't rolled that out yet. But I know that's something they're working on because I've discussed it with them specifically. I th did I just hear recently that Bilby's, um, <clears throat> uh, probably the best way to say it is receipt is got more backing and is growing and got, got acquired or something like that. No, they haven't gotten acquired or anything, but they, they're, they're doing very well. They have plenty of funding you know, just from their own actual revenues. That's the nice thing about them. Um, and they have some pretty smart people on their team. They have former PayPal and Intuit employees that they work with to help with product development. So anyway, let's get into some logic. Let's get into some conditional logic and Smartsheet so we can uh, finish this out this morning. So, and obviously anything that you set up 
like this is going to work the same way, right? The key is I have the due date and I have the next statement date. And like I said, my main focus is going to be on the next statement date, but we're going to look at both. We're going to create logic around both. And then Greg asked, and of course, I'm going to show you, and we can start here. How do we set the conditional logic for when we go below our prudent reserve, right? Let me just format this column for currency because believe it or not, it makes me absolutely nuts that that's not formatted nicely. So let's do that first. So over here is your conditional formatting palette, right? That's right here. Can everybody see where I'm pointing? So when I click this, I already have, because I had this built into the template, conditional logic built in. So for, we'll skip the first one for a minute. I'll come back to that right? But the, and, and the order of this matters. Whatever's first supersedes anything below it. And that's important to understand, right? So if the next statement date is in the past, right? Meaning we've gone past the next statement date. Today is a day later or more than a day later. Then it immediately lights the background up in red and yellow, right? So let's try that. So the uh, next statement date Sorry, I'm not going to do the prudent reserve yet because this just came up when I went into the conditional formatting. I forgot that I already had it built into the template. So if the next statement is before the 8th, which is today, if I make it, as soon as I make it the 7th, boom, right? So this calls my attention to the fact that something needs attention. When I have this completely fleshed out for a client, the minute I go in and I go into this, if I'm the one managing the account, I'm in here at least weekly. Right, my attention is immediately called to the stuff that needs attention. Now I know, oh crap, I better go download this statement and reconcile it, especially since it's a credit card and it's manual pay. You know, I need to make sure that gets handled right away so that it doesn't get paid late. Hey Seth, couldn't you, in a sense, then you could add an extra column that had something that always had today's date, or you could put in a formula today's date, so you could use a uh, I guess today's date wouldn't Yeah, but work. why do I want that when I have logic already built in that can compare with today's date? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> exactly. But you I mean, could, I could I could put in a formula. Never mind. My, I totally, you've given me a really good idea for something on this. Uh, all right, now you're keeping it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All right, great. How do you keep a jackass in suspense? <laughs> All right, so as soon as, so if I, that logic lets me know the minute I've gone past the statement date, right? But what if I've gone past the due date, right? What if the due date was February 5th? Okay. And that means the next statement date maybe was, maybe I haven't changed that yet because I haven't gotten there yet. So the next statement date was the first. Um, what am I doing wrong here? All right, let's check our logic. Oh, I didn't do uh, I didn't do the due date on this one. All right, that, I'm sorry. I thought this was the due date. This is this is the buffer. So, Greg, there's your logic. Let me back up though. I want to add in the logic for the due date. Basically, what I want to have happen once we're past the actual due date, and it needs to supersede the statement date rule. I want it to flip. I want the background red and the font yellow. I want there to be a clear difference when because if something's gone past the due date, hopefully I just forgot to update the dates, but I definitely want my attention called to that to be sure. So now we're going to add a new rule. Okay, so when I add a new rule, the first it's going to put it on the bottom. We'll fix that after, but I'm going to set the condition. So when I set the condition, it gives me a list of every column. And so what column do I want to test something about? right? So we're going to choose due date, right? And basically I need logic that says if the due date is before today, right? If it's before today, that means today has gone past the due date. So is in the past. There we go. If the due date is in the past, that's the condition we're testing. Then what do we do where it's, and you see how it's all hyperlinked. It makes it really clear to see like where to go to update or fix something. So if I go apply this format, now I want a red background and I want a yellow font, right? But that's not all because if this is last, then it's going to be less important than the next statement date rule. This one has to come before. So over here on the left, notice my mouse changes shape into the four arrow prong thing. I click and drag to reorder because this has to supersede this one. Because if I go past the statement date but not past the due date, then this will become effective. But once I go past the due date, this one has to supersede. 
All right, so now sure enough, if the due date is in the future, right, but the statement date is in the past, I have this color, right? But as soon as I go past the due date, if the due date is before today, which is the 8th, then automatically, like I really, like red means, hey, danger, we have a problem, we better make sure this gets taken care of right away. Right, so that's the logic. Now, Greg, your condition was already here, but your condition actually is uh, superseded by the due date issue, right? Because at that point, I'm not really, and the prudent reserve is more for a bank account than a credit card anyway, right? This would more likely apply to a bank account. So let's move that actually, because here it's sort of irrelevant. I don't usually have a prudent reserve for a credit card. So now separately, I can show you what happens if my prudent, if my current balance goes to 95,000, boom. Same kind of warning, danger Will Robinson background for a different reason in this case, because this rule became operative. The column that I use that checks, that compares the prudent balance to the account balance is called buffer. So the condition is if buffer is less than zero, right, then apply this format because the buffer is getting the difference. So that's just another way of saying if the current balance goes below the prudent reserve, apply this formatting, right? Now, Can in the then set set an alert to go yes. to somebody. Okay. So so glad you asked. So let's get into some conditions and alerts. Right. We've got the logic here. So if, let's go back to the next due date is the twenty eighth. We're fine there. Statement date is the thirteenth. Right. So now we're back to everything's good. Okay. So now let's add in some alerts and actions. And I'm going to go to manage alerts and actions because that just takes you into the whole dialogue, right? So if we want to create a new rule, there's different kinds of alerts and actions, right? I can alert someone. I can set a reminder, request an approval. So let's say I want to alert someone, right? Because I want to first alert myself when we've gone past the statement date, right? Because that's the first kind of trigger point, which means let's go download that credit card statement, get it reconciled, and make sure it's in there as a bill to be paid. Okay, so alert someone, we're gonna click create. Okay, and they've really built out this area nicely. It's gotten better and better and better all the time here. So, and, and the key is, because this is exactly the point that we get to where I see, and I'm gonna pause for a minute here because I wanna talk about this for a minute because I think it's important. So get your pens out because here come the pearls, okay? <laughs> that dialogue you just looked at is where a lot of us stop and say, oh God, this is too complicated, right? We get overwhelmed because we see all these choices, all these things we can do. And we're like, well, I don't know because we don't have an instruction book that says, hey Seth, here's exactly what to do. Because there is no here's exactly what to do. It's about what you need to accomplish and then figuring out how to use the tool to accomplish that, right? So what I'm trying to really pause here and impress upon everyone is the idea of when you get to that point, and when you start feeling that feeling of overwhelm and you start sweating because you get anxious and nervous and you're like, oh crap, I don't know how to do this. That's when it's time to take a deep breath and slow down, right? And I mean like really slow down, okay? And be patient most of all with yourself, right? Love yourself first. And now let's take another look and we're going to go through this nice and slow, okay? Everybody with me? Let's have a moment of calm. Take a deep breath. Right, um, right. we just did 97 and Zen at the Huntington Library. Now, first things first, what's the trigger, right? What's the thing that's gonna trigger whether or not an alert goes out? In this case, what I'm really trying to do is I wanna make sure that the minute we go past the statement date, an alert goes out to me and or to Erica and or to the client. In this case, we probably don't need the client to panic about it, we wanna know about it because clients will panic about anything we give them an opportunity to panic about. So I probably don't want this particular look going to the client. It's for me or Erica, whoever's managing the client, right? So what am I looking for? I can do, and here's, here's my choices. I can't do a specific date because then I got to update this rule every single time, right? Don't want to do that. I need it to be on autopilot. I can do when a row is added or changed, right? I can do when a row is added. I can do when a row, uh, uh, or do when a row is deleted, right? So that doesn't sound like something I, that's gonna work for me here, right? So let's cancel this. And this is, I did this on purpose because I wanted you to understand the logic. 
because we don't have the right kind of thing. We don't, so we don't want to alert somebody. Okay, so let's try set a reminder. That might actually work better because we want a reminder to go out that says, hey, we're past the statement date. We're gonna go to create. So here we have on a specific date, when a row is added or changed, when a row is changed, right? Uh, when a row is added, when a row is deleted. So that doesn't really sound like the logic. I really want something to be based on the fact that today is now past that statement date. Let's go to advanced. All right, I'm gonna do something here. I wanna check something, hold on. Could you, could you do a formula to where? No, 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 it's not that complicated and I just did this for a client so I wanna make sure when I show it to you, I show you exactly the right way because it works for my client. I just obviously can't show his screen. So bear with me one second. I just wanna see how I did it for him because I'm not recognizing it in the logic that they're showing us but like I said, I know I did this. So one minute. Okay, there it is. I found it, I, fig I fingered it out. I'll share my screen again. I just had to look at it. All right, so we are gonna do an alert, create. We're gonna do on a specific date. We are gonna do on a specific date, but we're gonna use a date field and we're gonna use next statement date. All right, my first thought, and I, I'm, I'm glad this happened because you might run into the same confusion, is that a specific date meant I had to specify the date, but no, because once we choose a specific date, then we can configure figure logic based on the proximity to that date, right? So we have next statement date, date field, and here's on. So notice, you have to move your mouse around and see there's lots of different little things. So I can do on the date, or I can do one day after. I wanna do one day after because oftentimes the date I've set, it may not be ready yet, right? One day after, probably gonna be ready. Keep in mind sometimes with these credit cards, they don't cut off on exactly the same day. So you may get here and find out that the statement doesn't cut off till tomorrow, fine. At least you know and you can update or put some kind of a tickler somewhere reminding yourself that tomorrow I need to go get the statement, right? But so typically that's what I do. I do it one day after based on the date field for the next statement date. Okay, here you can even set the time, right? So let's say I know, and if you know my logic for how I work with clients and how we work with clients in general at Nerd Enterprises, each client usually has a set day and time that they get worked on. It just helps the whole workflow go very smoothly. And it also helps so when clients send us stuff and say, hey, I need a report or I need this, we have a way to say, hey, here's what I'm gonna be working on your stuff next. Can it wait till then or do you need this immediately? Usually they say it can wait till then right? And if they say they need it immediately, then we gauge it and figure it out. But the bottom line is this way I know I can look on my calendar and in two seconds tell the client when they can expect me to work on this, right? It really helps to have it that organized. So I can, if I know this is a client I'm working on on Wednesdays in the afternoon, I might want to set this for 12 p.m., right? That's kind of what I'm getting at. So now conditions, okay? So on a specific date, we can add conditions, right? Or I can not. I don't necessarily need a condition because I've already got my conditions met here, right? It's a day after the statement date. Now we send the alert. Who gets the alert? I can send it to specific people, everyone who's shared to the sheet. Remember the sheet's shared with the client. So in this case, I'm not going to do that. Or I can send it to contacts in a cell because you can have a column in Smartsheet that has the contacts that that item is assigned to. And so this might be the way to go. In this case though, it's really just gonna go to specific people. It's gonna go to me, and I have all my 97 and up people here, so I can individually select myself and Erica, right? Because I know this, that, that we're the ones who need to get this particular alert every time. So I click save, and now that alert is done. Let's do one more based on the due date, okay? So now again on a specific date, date field, due date, right? This one we want at like nine, at 9 a.m., right? I wanna know right away when this happens. Uh, one day after. And here you can customize the message. I didn't show you that on the last one. So I can customize the message and say, um, 
Danger. Greg's credit card bill is late. You'd be getting a lot of those. He's going to be pissed. <laughs> right? And save. So as soon as this condition is met now, so now this is on autopilot. I can rely on the fact that Smartsheet is going to send me an email when, it goes, when something goes past its statement date. And I'm going to get another stronger one when it goes past the due date every single time, right? Now, of course, the key to this is, and this is part of our workflow, now we go in, if I go in and I reconcile and I say, okay, uh, it, let's say the uh, statement date was the 8th, right? Notice on the 8th, nothing changes. If the statement date was the 7th, boom, I go in, right? I go reconcile the credit card account, and after reconciling the credit card account, I now know the next due date is not till March 31st, and the next statement date is going to be something like March 7th. Right, so this has to be part of the workflow. When Erica's working on a client, reconciling their accounts, she's in Smartsheet. The second she finishes reconciling a credit card, she comes in here and updates the date, okay? Another alert we get when we update these balances, we have the balances check date. So I put this in, balances were checked today. I need one more alert in here. Again, on a specific date, this time based on the balances check date. Okay, and then actually I need it two days after the balances check date. Okay, down here, whoever's gonna be alerted. And this time I do want it to go to the client. So I'm pretty much gonna send it to everyone shared to this sheet, right? Um, no, I take that back. There's two alerts around this. One goes to us to remind us it's time to update the balances two days later. That's this one, okay? Because every two days I want to get reminded to update the balances. So this one is for us. So I'm going to alert myself and Erica, right? And I'm going to customize the message that just says update balances for client X, right? And then just something in the description just to have something there. Because Smartsheet is going to send you this email with a link to log directly into the Smartsheet project. That's what I love about this. And keep in mind, this is the very same project that has the access I need to get into the bank accounts and get the balances because I have the logins here, right? Or I've got them in LastPass. Either way, I'm in my browser and I've got them at my fingertips, right? So now we need one more alert so that when she does update the balances, we want, now when, whenever the balances are updated, I want another alert that goes out to everybody so that they can see what the updated balances look like. So let's go here, manage alerts and actions, right? Another alert we're gonna create. This time, when a row is changed, okay? Because that's the trigger here is we've, we've changed the row, we've updated the amounts in the uh, account balance column. And not when any field changes, but rather the current balance changes. I don't need any, any value, right? I just need to know that it's changed from whatever it was before, okay? And then here we send to everyone on the shared sheet. We can do send right away, once an hour, once a day, once a week. So I usually set this to once a day. Otherwise, if she's in there and she keys the balance and then she realizes, oh wait, wrong account and she changes it, everybody's going to start getting 60 emails, right? So I almost never do right away. Do once a day, that should work. And again, we're going to customize the balance. The subject says updated balances for Wells Fargo. Keep one thing really important in mind, that this is going to put the information from the row in Smartsheet into the email, which means you're exposing their balances directly in the email. Some clients may get upset about that. Mine generally don't, but some clients may say, some accountants may say, I don't want that going out in an email, right? The truth is, again, I use G Suite, which is ridiculously secure, so I'm not worried about that. You know, you know G Suite has every possible security certification you can imagine, from FINRA to SOC to, you know, the bank encryption level. G Suite, contrary to what a lot of people say in social media because they don't actually do their own homework, G Suite is incredibly secure. Okay, so that's basically the lay of the land here in terms of how I use Smartsheet to manage this granular level 
stuff that has to be managed with respect to clients. I would never do this in Active Collab or Asana or any of these other higher level project management tools that we use. Those tools are not well equipped for this kind of detailed management of stuff, right? Seth, one quick question. Um, if I remember correctly, I saw it had the forms tab there also. Mm -hmm. Kind of like auto create the form for you as you're using the different. Just like, just like Airtable. If I go to create a form, it will automatically populate every column in that form, assuming I want to grab that. And then I can customize it and say, no, I don't want this field on the form, you know, and so on. So yeah, it's, it's, another, it's another webinar for another Friday, but it's really easy to build forms with this off of your table, just like Airtable. There's a lot of overlap between this and Airtable. Airtable uh, is really slick when it comes to linking things in different tables, right? That's where Airtable really supersedes Smartsheet. That reminds me, that's the other thing I, we talked about yesterday that actually triggered all this I didn't even touch on today. We're a little bit over time though, is you can link things from one project in Smartsheet to another. But that's where Airtable is far superior when you're trying to link things from different places. Airtable is much more of a, uh, an app that you would use to build a real database, whereas Smartsheet is more of a really robust project management application. So it's, again, a lot of overlap. The other thing with Airtable and the downside of it is it gets very expensive because you're paying per user per month, right? So anytime I want to collaborate, if I want somebody to be able to go in there and change things, I need to pay for them. Right, and if I want to create a separate workspace in Airtable for each client, and I have, uh, let's say, me and Erica are in the Nerd Enterprises workspace and that client's workspace, I'm paying for each of those users twice. I'm paying for me and Erica twice. So you're paying per user per workspace. So Airtable gets very expensive very quickly. So for now, I really only use Airtable on stuff that only I need to get in there and tinker with, and where everyone else is kind of view only, right? because it's just too expensive for me to start collaborating with people in Airtable. I need to start making a lot more money before I can afford to do that. But that's their pricing. I reached out to them and said, I even said, I said, this seems ridiculous that I can't have a, the same person in multiple workspaces without having to pay for them twice. And they're like, well, that's the way we work it. Because their, their workspaces aren't really meant to be like projects like we do them, like we use workspaces in Smartsheet. So anyway. I pay for two of us right now, and it's 20 bucks per month, you know, per user. So I'm paying 40 bucks per month for me and Erica. So that's all I use it for. It's, it's, again, I use it for strictly internal stuff. So when I need something like that uh, without paying an arm and a leg, that's where Smartsheet comes in, right? And real quick, since most of you are all still here, I'll show you how you can link things in Smartsheet. So if I wanted to, let's say, add a... I don't know, a project to this, right? That's kind of the use case we looked at yesterday. So here I might have tasks, right? Forget about the actual use case here. Um, let's say I want to link this to a particular project. I can right click on the cell, link from cell in other sheet. If I zip this up, I can find my 97 and up workspace and I can link to the client X monthly bookkeeping uh, project. Let it load and create a link, boom. And now this link is live. If I click on it, it'll take me right over to this client's monthly bookkeeping checklist, right? So that's just real quick how you can easily, you, so it is easy enough to link things. So now, Matthew, you can think of some of the other possibilities because you can make this a very database-like environment where I can have one project that's got a list of all of my clients and another project that's got, uh, that, and, and the projects that I work on, right? So I have a column for the client, a column for the project, I might repeat the client for each project I'm working on for them, which means I might now have a separate table for just clients and all their information. And why this came up, by the way, was somebody said, oh, I'm going to use a Smartsheet and I'm going to use projects in QBO. And I said, no, don't bother. If you're going to do that, just, just use Smartsheet. Do your projects in Smartsheet. Do everything in Smartsheet, right? This way you have everything in one place because you can create a project that's just tasks. And by the way, Smartsheet's mobile app, kicks ass its mobile app is awesome right and you can get in there and you can so we're talking about this you have like your main sort of task list in Smartsheet where you can quickly just on the fly you're in a meeting with the client you want to make a note and so you don't forget oh I need to do this this and that you can put it in there and later you can move it or copy it over to the actual project right the key to a lot of this stuff especially when we're out and about and working is having a, an app that makes it easy for you to add stuff on the fly 
And that also makes it easy to transfer that stuff. Very easy to do in any of these apps. Even Active Collab, I can bang out a note, you know, or a task real quick, and later on I can copy that note to any project or to copy that task to any project, right? All these apps that we're looking at will do that very well. Smartsheet, definitely no exception. Um, again, you gotta, it's, and again, they, and the thing I love about Smartsheet is these guys are home. And what I mean by that is they're constantly working on this and adding updates and rolling out new features and constantly making it better and better. There's a lot of apps I've looked at where it seems like nobody's home, right? It's just, it's just like they built the app, they threw it out there, and it's like, go have fun, but they're not doing anything, right? A good example of that, totally unrelated to this kind of app, was Penzu. Penzu is a really cool journaling app, right? And I was looking for it to replace Evernote at one point, but nobody was home at that company. You go onto their Facebook page, it's a ghost town, right? Mm -hmm. But the app's still there, still works, but I got nervous. One day it'll disappear. One day they'll just shut down, right? So I stopped using it for that reason. Anyway, if you like what you see and you're not already in 97 and up, join 97 and up. End of story. <laughs> And then we do this every Tuesday and Thursday. And Matt's got to go, which means I got to go. Because if Matt goes, I go. I go wherever <laughs> Matt goes. <laughs> Bromance. Bromance. <laughs> oh, oh. oh Wait, I'm not good at, I'm not good at these hand to, emojis. If we do dinner on Wednesday, it'll be a nerd day or va nerd. How can I do Valentine's Day? Only, only if Linda agrees oh, to fly out God, for it. That's us. Valentine's Day? You guys are going out on a date on Valentine's Day? Thursday is. Come on, get it straight. Oh, Thursday is Valentine's Day, so you guys are doing pre-Val. They yeah. are. We're doing Valentine's Day Eve. We're doing nerd Val. Yeah, Val nerd. So I'm, all right, this is, this is about to go straight yeah. into the gutter, <laughs> so let's just stop here. <laughs> Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye.